Okay. Good morning. How are we? <laughs> Sleep good? Yeah. Not, not me. I'm okay. I'm okay. So, as you all know, my name is Ben. Benjamin. I'll be with you most of the day today, and then towards the afternoon, we'll, we'll maybe switch to Amelie. Um, and she'll, we kind of are working together. So I'm gonna introduce land cover, land use. She's gonna go into you guys making your own land cover, land use, uh, and calculating changes in land cover and land use. So this morning is gonna be all about the fundamentals, okay, the basics. So how many here have, have had a course in this, in land cover and land use, or some sort of training at some point? Okay, so it's just good to know where everybody is and, and where we need, how far back we need to go. So we'll start at the very beginning. Of course, one day is, is never enough, but we're gonna do the best we can and at least try to give you guys a baseline from which you can build on that in your own time uh, and, and learn some of these tools on your own time and develop your own skills uh, as you go along because that's what this is all about, really. You, you ha also have to put the time in. You have to put your own training time in, and it takes a long time. Um, I've been doing this for years, and learning how these software works, and, and just figuring it out. So we're gonna try to get you started, and hopefully get you confident enough that you can do it on your own uh, and, uh, to answer some of your own questions that you have. Okay, so here we are. We'll go over the fundamentals here this morning. Uh, we'll have a tea break. We're gonna go into the data sources and the data access. There's a lot out there, probably some that you knew about, probably some that you didn't know about. Um, and then maybe before lunch, we'll start to get into the exercise on QGIS and we'll finish in the afternoon after lunch and hopefully by the end of my session today, you guys will have calculated the land cover statistics for Rwanda or for your own country if you like. Uh, from 2015, and maybe you will also, I've also downloaded some GBIF data for uh, a family that I, that I like, a family of plants that I like, and we're gonna see if we can see any differences between the urban distribution of these plants and the non-urban distribution of these plants. Okay, and really if we have time, we're gonna try to do it both in QGIS and R. Okay, and I'll explain the differences between the two, but um, we're gonna start with QGIS because it's, it's a little bit easier to, to get started with GIS. It's more visual. Um, and if you, are, if you are the type of person that really likes to code and you really like to type and, and use computer codes, um, then we also have a script that I can go over with you at any time as well. Uh, and that can kind of get you started with the R platform as well. So I'll talk about the differences between QGIS and R what's good for which situations and what's not so good for other situations. Okay? Any questions before we begin? Can you see? Okay. So this is kind of the data that we're gonna be focusing on today. This is uh, a land cover map for Rwanda for 2015. Okay, so the f one of the f most basic concepts that we need to understand, and, and it's often a source of confusion, is the difference between land cover and land use. And this is something that I was confused about when I first started with this as well. It's often, these terms are often mis- or interchanged within the scientific literature. But land cover is basically just the distribution of different types of land. Okay, it doesn't matter if it's human, it doesn't matter if it's natural, it's what we have. All right, the vegetation or man-made constructions which occur on the Earth's surface. Whereas land use, right, is the, the word use, it has this implicit meaning. It means that some, somebody or something is using it and that means us. So how, what are the ways that we are actually using the land? Okay, so it could be a forest that we're using it could be agriculture that we're using. Uh, it could be uh, a settlement that we're using, and that's land use. Oftentimes what we really see is kind of a mix between the two. So we have maps and data that are actually a mix of both land cover and land use. Does everybody understand the difference between those two? Yes. 
Okay. So land cover. This is, this is kind of a mix, one of those situations where it's a little bit of a mix between both. Right? This is for Rwanda for 2015. We have cover types, so we have wetland, forest land, uh, water bodies. Those are typical types of land cover. But then we also have land use types like cropland, uh, settlements. Those are the different ways that we're actually using the land. Okay, so in this case we have both. And the reason that a lot of times we have both is because humans, the human presence on the earth is, is almost ubiquitous. And that means that it's, it's really kind of almost everywhere. So it's really hard to find patches of the earth uh, where we actually haven't used the land somehow in some way. So oftentimes, and, and a lot of times, the maps, the places that we're studying are really places where humans are using the land. So we often have this mix of both land cover and land use when we look at the data. So um, it's not terribly important. You know, nobody is going to strike you down for misusing these terms, but it is kind of important that we understand the difference between the two. Okay, hi. Uh, my question relates to what you have just said regarding the difference between land cover and land use. And you have said that <coughs> land cover could be a vegetation or man-made uh, man construction, something like that. Uh -huh. And the land use is all about operations performed. Now, being working in the field of wildlife management, sometimes we see most of the time we say, we say the land type is for conservation purpose. For example, a national park. Uh -huh. So that is a type of land use again. Well, but it's again, it has vegetation. No. It's both. Yes, yes. So it can be both. Yes. So you can say land use and land cover. Yes. The land cover is forest, mm -hmm. but the land use is a protected area. OK, and it has both. That's, so that's in, in that sense, I would say it's both. So that's kind of what I mean by there is a little bit of, a, of an interchange between the two, um, but, it, but there is a difference, okay? A forest, a protected forest, it's a forest, so it's a land cover, but because we're protecting it, that means that we're using it for something. We're using it for protection. So it's kind of both in that sense. So this is kind of maybe what you would consider maybe a kind of a more pure land cover map, right? We have forest, grassland, wetland, and cropland. Now, cropland, of course, is a, is a use. We're using it to grow crops, but it's also a cover. Uh, so again, even, even if it's mostly land cover, we still have a little bit of land use in there. So we have the different vegetation types. We have the different water types. We can have what we call impervious surface. So in this case, an impervious surface means water cannot get through the, the ground. It's impervious to water. It means water doesn't filter through it. And that has a lot of implications for ecology, right? If water can't go into the soil, it has to go somewhere else. And that means it gets pushed or pulled to different places. And that changes the ecosystem in a lot of ways. So in this case, it's an impervious surface. It doesn't explain how we're using that surface, just that the surface is impervious. Okay, so that's kind of a land cover definition. And we can also have barren areas, places where there is no vegetation. These are usually desert or ice or maybe sometimes rock. Uh, sometimes shorelines also are considered barren. Okay, so these are kind of maybe the most general forms of land cover that you'll see. Whereas land use gets much more complicated because humans use the land in a lot of different ways. Okay, so we have, for instance, in urban areas, we use it for roads, we use it for buildings, we use it for parking lots. Those are all impervious surfaces. So it's one cover type, it's an impervious surface, but it has many different land uses. Is that clear? Yes. Okay. Here's another different type of, of land use, agriculture. And of course, we have different types of agriculture. 
Okay, we can have crops, plants that we grow, livestock, animals that we grow, plantations, trees that we grow. We can also have fallow, which means it's an agricultural land that is currently being regenerated. We're not using it for, for grazing, but we're probably going to use it again for grazing in the future. That's what fallow is. So it's another type of land use. And we can have different intensities. Moderately intense, intense, extensive grasslands. Okay, so we have all of these different levels. And we'll talk about all these different levels and how complicated they can get or how general they can be. We can also have government land use. This is a big deal in the west, in the west side of the United States. The government owns much of the land there. And it comes into conflict with a lot of people sometimes because the government tells people how they can or cannot use the land and the people don't like that. So this is one way that we, we picture land use, in this case, by the government. And the government has a lot of different ways that they use the land. Forest conservation, military, grazing, indigenous lands. And then a lot of times what we see is, again, a mix of both. Okay, so here we have evergreen forests, degraded evergreen forests. That implies that humans have used that land somehow for some reason. It's degraded. Swamps, mangroves, mosaics a lot of times. We have a mix of both forest and cropland. Okay, so it, it's not just one, but it's kind of a mix of both. We have different types of agriculture. Rain-fed agriculture, irrigated agriculture. Okay, again, this is a case where we're getting very particular and very detailed about the types of land use that we have. And when we do that, we can create really beautiful maps, right? I love maps. I'm a big map fan, especially if you can create something like this. It says a lot about an entire continent, doesn't it? You can look at this map and get a really good idea of what's happening in Africa, where the economic centers are, where there's probably more rural indigenous people, where there's probably more metropolitan people, okay, just by looking at the map. So that's one of the reasons we use maps, because they really give us sometimes a very good understanding of what's happening on, on the earth in very detailed ways. So why does this matter? Wh why do we care about land cover and land use? Anybody? It really matters to know the type of land use so that you can determine certain activities to perform within that land use. For example, you can take uh, a part of a desert and say you're going to do farming. In a okay. You have to know which activity can be done in a desert in a rainforest or in a savanna Good. Uh, area. So I think it's very vital to know uh, the land use and what activities you want to Good. perform. Yeah. In order for us to, to know what's possible to do in a certain area, we have to know what's already there. Okay, yes. Here. Thank you. Uh, we can use land use and land cover uh, in the restoration process, for example, when you are restoring the areas, you may see what has been there and what could be done. For example, we can measure the buildings and the human activities here. Good. Okay. Yeah. So for conservation purposes, of course, we need to know what's there to conserve in order to know what we are conserving, right? Uh huh. One more. Yeah, I have a question. Ah, okay, question. Um, looking at the land cover and the land use definitions, uh, just imagining a scenario. When we have <coughs> in a city setting, uh -huh. like Kigali, and we have a park. Uh -huh. we're, we're planning to have a park in Kigali, uh -huh. one side of Kigali. And this park is going to be, let's say, five hectares. And we have one hectare that has trees. Uh -huh. 
What is the land cover? What is the land use there? Okay. So the question is, we have a city. It's a city, so it's urban. But we're putting a park there with trees. So what is the land cover? Is it urban or is it forest? And I would say it depends. It depends on who's making the map. It depends on who's asking. Um, and it depends on the resolution of the data that you have. So we'll talk a little bit more about resolution and why that's important. Um, but it can be both urban and forest at the same time. It can be what we call an urban forest. Um, but again, maybe if, there, if, you, have, if you only have a, a measurement of one kilometer by one kilometer, and 51% of that area is urban, then maybe it's urban. 49% is forest, but 51% is urban, and we have to choose between the two, then it's urban. Okay, but maybe we have a, a smaller area. We can do 500 meters by 500 meters. Then half of it is urban and half of it is forest. Okay, so it depends on a lot of different things, but it can be both. And we'll talk about how do we navigate these, these conflicts uh, later in the day. So we discussed why this is important and basically what we said is in, in order to know what's possible on a land surface, we need to know what's there. So in order for us to know the status and the planning potential of the land, we have to know what's there. What do we currently have? We have to take an inventory, okay? How much forest, wetlands, and grasslands do we have? How much of that is natural habitat? How much of that, how much carbon is in that nat natural habitat? How much agricultural land is available? We have this many people that needs to be fed. And we have this much land that can produce agriculture. So we have to get this much food out of this much land. And so, and then how can this status, this inventory of land, help us explain these different natural and social phenomenon that we observe in the world. Okay, so certain areas we have higher species than other areas. Can we use land cover to describe those differences between species numbers? Maybe, maybe not. It might describe some of that difference, but that's really important, okay? We need to be able to understand if land cover is driving the differences that we see in, in the natural world and in the social world as well. But we also need to understand the changes that are happening. And this is what Amelie is gonna walk us through tomorrow. How has this land cover changed over the past year? Five years, 10 years, 100 years? When we look at the curve from the past 50 years, it really helps us understand what's gonna happen in the next 50 years. And that's, of course, is in incredibly important for our planning purposes. We can't just live in the present. We have to be able to plan for the future. And looking at changes in land cover over time really helps us understand what can we expect. How much is the city of Kigali going to expand in the next 10 years? The best way to answer that question is to look at how it has expanded in the previous 10 years. Okay, so these, these, are, the different, these are the really important ways that we use land cover uh, in, in science and in our daily lives. Not only in science, but in, in governmental planning as well. And this importance is, is, there's a lot of evidence for this importance. So if we look at the mention of the term land cover, we do a search, an academic search for land cover from 1970 to 2019. We see it's becoming, it has become extremely important over the last few decades. So we're publishing these scientific articles that are mentioning land cover. And that means that scientists are finding that land cover is important for their results. And the way that they explain some of these phenomena that they're observing. 
Where, where are these publications being published? Remote sensing of the environment is the number one. This is the types of journals that they're being published in. Of course, the way that we measure land cover is by remote sensing. So a lot of these publications are sort of methodology publications or just observational publications. But a lot of them are actually scientific hypothesis-driven journals. Science of the environment, ecological indicators, agricultural ecosystem and environment, environmental monitoring and assessment, biological conservation. All of these different science fields are using land use and land cover a lot in their, in their terms when they write about their, the phenomenon that they're observing. So again, there's an, more evidence that land cover is really important for us, and so we need to understand it. This is the number of civilian imaging satellites launched in the last 50, 40 or 50 years. This is not military satellites. This is not communication satellites. These are civilian imaging satellites. So these are satellites specifically designed to look at the Earth. And what do we see? Again, an exponential increase in the number of missions. Okay, so that tells us that we're spending more and more and more money, and it's a lot of money. Hundreds of millions and billions of dollars to launch these instruments into space. Why would we spend so much money on these instruments? Increasingly. This wasn't enough. This isn't enough. This isn't enough. We're still doing it. That's because governments are recognizing that this is an extremely important field. It's really helping us understand the patterns that we're observing on the Earth and what's going to happen with the Earth in the future. Again, this is the number of sensors at different resolutions launched on all of these satellites. And we see that not only are we launching more satellites, but we're launching more sensors. So we have one satellite with lots of different sensors. Not only is it looking at the visible world, but it's looking at heat signatures. Or it's looking at some other type of observation that might tell us a little bit more about the patterns that we're observing on the Earth. And we're also seeing an increase in the resolution. The resolution is the detail that we can see. And I'll explain it a little bit more, but it's how much detail that we can see. The lower the resolution, the more detail we can see. Well, the lower the size of the resolution, the more we can see. And what we see is that the size of the resolution is decreasing because we want to see better and better detail. So, we can launch satellites into space and we can look down. And we can look at a globe. A three-dimensional ball of rock and water that is floating in space. How do we put that on a computer screen and have it make sense and have the dimensions match up. Okay, this is one of the biggest technical challenges of land cover and land use. And I'll explain why. So, so here you see, for example, somebody's attempt to do this. You've all seen this example. Take a globe and lay it flat. You can't do it without somehow changing it, right? You have to cut it somehow. You have to stretch it somehow. You can't take a three-dimensional globe and make it flat without changing something. So this is somebody's attempt to do that. And there are literally thousands of ways that we do this. And so one of the really technical challenges of land cover and remote sensing is understanding what is the best way of doing this for me, for my question. So typically, we have two different types of what we call coordinate reference systems or spatial reference systems. The three-dimensional globe system, the one that we probably are most familiar with, is called the geographic. Okay, geo meaning Earth, right? So it implies that we're talking about this three-dimensional sphere. 
and we measure it in degrees. We measure it in degrees because we're talking about the degree from the center, north and south, and the degree from the center, east and west. What we call latitude and longitude, right? Degrees only make sense if you're talking about a circular object. But we, when we're looking at something on a computer screen, or when we're trying to measure areas, it doesn't make sense to use degrees. I can tell you we have 0 0.05 degrees squared of forests in Rwanda. What does that mean to you? Very little, right? It's very difficult to think what is a 0 0.05 degrees squared of forest. So we have to put that into meters squared. But a meter is one dimensional, 